Hello and good morning. My name is Claude Johnson, and uh, I am uh, a new member of the Board of Directors of the Ephemeral Society of America. My specialty is early African American basketball history. So, if, and this goes before the NBA, back to the early 1900s. I'd like to introduce, and by the way, this is now about Vikings who immigrated to where, where you're going to talk about. Uh, so it's a slight contrast. Um, <laughs> but I'd like to introduce Rachel Shea Donaldson, who's earning her Bachelor of Arts in History from the University of Tampa and has been serving as an intern at the Henry B. Plant Museum of Tampa since earlier this year. She wrote a senior thesis about a sixth century extreme weather event and how it impacted Viking migration and movements and presented it at the 59th Florida Conference of Historians in, in Sarasota also this year. And she's currently a member of the Society for Collegiate Leadership and Achievement a member of the National Society of Collegiate Scholars, and a Phi Alpha Theta National History Honor Society member. Please welcome Rachel Shea Donaldson. Um, <clears throat> so hello, my name is Rachel Donaldson, uh, again from the Tampa's Henry B. Plant Museum. And today, I will be presenting ephemera um, related to Ybor City and the immigrants who live there. In the late 1860s to the 1870s, large portions of the Cuban cigar industry moved to the United States. The cigar industry started in Havana and initially moved to Key West, but they quickly found out that the island was far too small. They went out seeking more land and better infrastructure to go, grow. In 1886, they found Tampa, my home. Um, a small town with a population less than 1,000 people. Tampa was seeking to attract industry to grow and develop, and the cigar industry was seeking um, a better place to grow. It was a match made in heaven. Ybor City started with two factories, the Ybor factory, which is shown at the top there, the cigar label. And then the lower label shows the Sanchez y Haya factory, the second factory. The Ybor factory was created by Vicente Martinez Ybor who was a leading cigar manufacturer in Cuba, whereas the Sanchez y Haya factory was created by Ybor's friendly competitor, Ignacio Haya. Both were essential in the growth of the city, bringing in large immigrant populations. Because of the cigar industry, Tampa had grown to 100,000 people, and at its peak contained 287 cigar factories, causing it to become the cigar capital of the world by the early 1920s. Ybor's flagship brand was Principe de Gal or Prince of Wales. It was a very popular cigar brand with worldwide acclaim, with some of its main customers located in England. The cigar label on the upper right corner um, has Tampa, Havana, Key West written on it to reflect the history of the shift from Havana to safer sites, like Tampa. Cigar artisans and craftsmen all came to Tampa to practice their cigar rolling craft. But even though the cigar production was in Tampa, the cigar companies continued to use the high quality Cuban tobacco and the Spanish method of rolling them, continuing the tradition of Cuban cigars. Early Ybor and West Tampa were essentially a Spanish and Cuban settlement that just happened to be in the United States. E economically and culturally, it was connected more to Cuba um, than the United States. It was the arrival, oh wait, sorry. It was connected more to, Cupu uh, to Cuba, which at that point was still a part of Spain than it was to the rest of the United States. It was the arrival of the cigar industry from Key West and Cuba, along with the Spanish, Cuban, and Sicilian immigrants that established Tampa as a major industrial city as it is known today. And I've also included a map of early Ybor. Whereas many immigrants to other cities had to assert themselves into an area um, already ex with an already existing economic and social system, Tampa's immigrants essentially established these economic and social systems in Tampa. Immigrants were essential to the growth of Tampa and Ybor City. This pamphlet illustrates the many groups that came to make up Ybor and West Tampa. Residents of Ybor City and West Tampa came from Cuba, Spain, Italy, and the United States, as you can see represented on the flags. There were also smaller numbers of Romanian Jews and Germans who also called Ybor City home. 
This pamphlet also shows the ongoing efforts in Ybor to preserve and celebrate the multicultural heritage of Ybor City. The vast majority of immigrants to Ybor were from Spain and Cuba, with an especially large percent coming from the northern province of Spain, Asturias. Spanish immigration to Tampa was a subset of Spanish immigration to Cuba. This is a membership card from the Centro Asturiano de Cuba, one of the many mutual aid societies in Ybor. The Centro Asturiano de Cuba was a branch of the Centro Asturiano de la Habana until the 1950s. The Centro Asturiano was particularly large, which was a special phenomenon since mutual aid societies of such magnitude were rare in the United States. This focal point of immigrant life were the mutual aid societies. Several historians have noted that they have been essential in the shaping of Ybor and the immigrant life. Tampa and Ybor City were truly the, the cigar capitals of the world, producing 500 million cigars per year. The cigar industry put Tampa and Ybor City on the map, and people who lived there were proud of their industry, using signs to showcase their accomplishments. This sign was located on the side of a large gas storage tank owned by the People's Gas Company that stood between downtown Tampa and Ybor City. It indicated the importance of the cigar industry to, camp to Tampa. By the 1920s, Tampa had become the cigar manufacturing capital of the world, replacing Havana. Many Anglo-owned private businesses profited from the cigar industry, such as shipping companies, electric companies, and streetcar companies. These companies had a vested interest in promoting the cigar industry. 1930 was the peak year for cigars. During and after the Depression, though, demand for cigars began to decline. This slide displays various cigar labels from factories in Ybor City. Note the middle label, Cuesta Rey. It was one of the largest factories in Ybor City with around 1,000 workers, and it specifically mentioned imported Cuban tobacco to advertise it was on using only the highest quality of tobacco in its cigars. Cuesta Rey's cigars were considered such high quality that even the King of Spain bought cigars from the company. Again, these were high and medium quality cigars that were being made, which meant that they only used the best of the best for tobacco which in that case was the Cuban tobacco. American tobacco was still considered inferior because, of, because compared to the quality of the Cuban tobacco. Similarly, the Bustillo label includes a, the phrase clear Havana, which again refers to the type of high quality cigar it was. Some of the German immigrants were employed in the lithographic production of these labels. They drew on their experiences from beer labels to create and draw the cigar labels. While the German community was very small, it was very influential in Ybor. Tampa, unlike other Florida cities, was essentially a turn of the century brick and steel immigrant industrial city and self-identified as such. Most other Florida cities at the time had economic economies based on agriculture, tourism, or retirement. But Tampa, Ybor, and West Tampa had their economies based in the cigar industry. It was truly an industrial city. Tampa was like a Baltimore or Pittsburgh with palm trees. Life in Tampa was and still is very different from most of Florida, especially Ybor City and West Tampa. This slide depicts leaf selectors at a cigar factory, a very important job when creating high-quality high cigars. These workers would select and sort out the leaves, separating them by high, medium, and cheap quality, and then all the leaves would be imported from Cuba. This is another postcard that depicts some of the jobs in the Ybor cigar factories. A vast majority of immigrants worked in the cigar factories with some of the larger companies employing up to 1,000 or more immigrants. Some Ybor families operated their own factories, although they were smaller companies employing fewer than 10 people at a time. At Ybor's peak in the late 1920s, there were 287 cigar factories in Tampa. It was a rare for any city to have more than 10 factories, making Ybor and Tampa truly special. The postcard depicts another important job at the factories, as I mentioned earlier, known as the cigar roller. Rolling cigars was considered a skilled craft and only certain people could do the job correctly. Women were employed at the factories and paid on an equal basis as men. They worked alongside them, and which was truly an anomaly for the time. Another anomaly at, in Ybor for the time was the fact that both black and white Cubans, who were the first groups to come over from Tampa, worked together and lived near one another. Black Cubans even had their own union, the Sociedalo Union of Tampa, which was very interesting because this was during the Jim Crow South era. 
but Kiwa did not have the same segregation as the South, and this carried over to Tampa and Ybor City. And law enforcement and officials looked the other way to let Tampa do its own thing and remain successful. This was until the Depression, when Jim Crow laws began to be enforced and white men were replacing the workers in the factories. These postcards are unusual because of the fact that they aren't showing beaches like other cities in Tampa, but rather they were showcasing the city's industrial nature and its immigrants. The lectors were some of the most important aspects of Ybor and West Tampa cultural fabric. Lector means reader in Spanish. They were usually men, multilingual, and educated. They were paid by the workers, not the factory. The custom of lectors at factories began in Havana. The lectors would read to the workers while they worked, usually newspapers from Spain, Cuba, Italy, and also the US, and in the morning, and then classic novels in the afternoon. The lectors would need to be multilingual since they would need to read in Spanish, Italian, and English. They were employed in order to cut boredom. Since there was no radio at the time, the, so that the workers could play in the background. By the early 1930s, the lectors were being considered by the factory owners to be socialist agitators and were banned from being present at the factories. Workers rallied together to protest in order to get the lectors back in the factories, but in the end, they lost. This meant that there were no active lectors in the, fa in the factories after the early 1930s. La Gazzetta was a significant and popular newspaper for Ybor City. Tampa and West Tampa, and um, for Tampa and West Tampa, and it is still published today. Arguably, La Gazzetta was the first and only trilingual newspaper in the United States, publishing in Spanish, English, and Italian. This showcased the unique immigrant population present in Ybor City and Tampa. Victoriana Montega, who was a leader, who was a leading lector and socialist advocate. Um, founded the newspaper. Until the 1960s, there were at least three similar newspapers in Ybor City and West Tampa. La Gazzetta was the only newspaper with a direct cable service from Cuba to and Spain. This hinted at how life in Tampa was more connected to Spain and Cuba rather than the rest of the United States. These new newspaper ads feature the two best known restaurants and cafes in Ybor City. The Columbia, which opened in 1905 and is still operating, and Las Novedades, which opened in 1890, but closed in the early 1970s. Las Novedades means the novelties, and also refers to fancy pastries. Notice that one of the ads in, is in English while the other is in Spanish. This reflects the blending of cultures within Ybor City. Also note the mix of English and Spanish in the Las Novedades ad. Lunch, as we know it, did not exist in Spain at this time. Most immigrants were from the countryside where there would be no meal at midday. Because of this, there was no word for lunch in Spanish. And also, the same goes for restaurant, which was a new concept for the immigrants. And the Las Novedades ad, the surname of the, of the owner is a Basque name. This again refers to the immigration from northern Spain. This also shows some degree of assimilation. Since in Spain, everyone has two surnames, your father's family name followed by your mother's whose surname would remain the same when she would marry and carry on with her the rest of her life. But Manuel Iraola um, didn't, does not have two surnames. This was because this practice was causing confusion in Spain. So many immigrants, so many immigrants chose to adopt the American system of family names. The owner's first name is Manuel, and his father's name was Iraola, and he chose to drop his mother's name. Again, a common practice for immigrants in Tampa. In the Columbia ad, note the reference to South Florida. While this appears trivial, this speaks to Florida in the early 1900s. Other than Key West, most of the development in Florida was in the north. Ybor and Tampa were boom towns in an otherwise undeveloped part of Florida. Miami did not really exist as a city until the 1920s. Again, no one would consider Tampa to be in South Florida nowadays, but in the early 1900s, this was on the southern edge of the developed Florida mainland. This reflects the fact that Tampa was a boom town and what was recently a new frontier. The photo on the left is the cantina, in, in the clubhouse of El Centro Español de Tampa, the Spanish center of Tampa. This was a private nonprofit mutual aid society. These were only for men. They would meet in evenings, play cards or dominoes, talk politics and gossip. 
It was a crucial part of the immigrants' lives. On the right, note that the Las Novedades ad is in English, whereas the previous ad was in Spanish. This reflects the bridging of the two worlds that existed in Tampa and Ybor City. It showed how Anglo-Tampa had begun to embrace some Spanish um, customs, as long as the Ybor City customs. A major part of the cultural fabric of Ybor City in West Tampa was the bolita culture. Bolita in Spanish means small ball. This was an illegal numbers game popular from the 1920s to the 1960s and 70s. This game was controlled by the Tampa Mafia and was based on the, on the legal Cuban lottery. The Tampa Mafia had roots, roots in southwest Sicily and was controlled from, ta from Tampa and stretched over all of Tampa, West Tampa, and Ybor City. The Tampa Mafia was also closely linked to the New Orleans Mafia. Verbena means an open air dance or festival. This celebration of Tampa's cigar heritage was a popular yearly event in the 1950s, into the 1950s, taking various forms. Note the bilingual nature of the poster, reflecting some gradual assimilation of the Anglo and Spanish inhabitants of Ybor and Tampa. The woman depicted on the flyer is dressed in the costumes typical to Southern Spain, specifically from the area called Andalusia. Almost all Spaniards in Tampa were from Northern Spain, where the culture is totally different, and everything from the foods to the dress to the lifestyle was completely exotic to them. In the United States, there was a fascination with things Spanish starting in the, in the 20s. This ref was reflected by the popularity of the Spanish revival architecture in the 20s, as seen in the Tampa Theater. Many Spanish businesses and entities in Tampa used this to popularize their messages even though the Spanish heritage of Tampa was vastly different. This is also seen in the design of the Columbia restaurant, which is considered to look very Southern Spanish. This flyer reflects that old Tampa, Ybor City, and West Tampa were well known within Cuba as a bastion of progressive thinking and activism. The fact that Jose Marti raised lots of money for Cuba's revolution against Spain in the 1890s is a recognized part of Cuban history. It's even taught in Cuban schools. Tampa was pivotal for the 1898 Cuban independence from Spain and the Spanish Civil War. Tampa was progressive and supportive of workers' rights and a very strong activism advocate. And the poster even states that they helped out with natural disasters, raising money, and they also, like I mentioned, helped striking workers and workers' rights. These are some more activism post like flyers that also highlighted the activism in Ybor City. It was such a major part of Ybor and the people who live there. On the flyer on the far right, paragraph two makes a specific mention of Batista's, Castro's predecessor, having committed atrocities by having his executioners kill rebels after they had put down their weapons. Ybor was very involved in Cuban politics and current events, and these flyers showcase that. This slide features a July 26 Patriotic Club of Tampa membership card and receipt for dues. The Cuban government recognized July 26, 1953 as the start of the Castro Revolution, which overthrew Batista, the former dictator. And it was considered a very important day in both, Cuba, in both Cuba and Ybor City. Note the certificate on the far right with the map of Cuba. The drawing indicates the second anniversary of the landing in Cuba of the yacht called Grandma. It is actually misspelled on the certificate. You can kind of see that. Um, after Castro's failed attempt at attacking military barracks on July 26, 1953, he was imprisoned and subsequently t went into exile in Mexico in 1954. Two years later, he and fellow revolutionaries bought an old yacht and sailed back to Cuba, clandestinely to begin their revolution anew. Since the revolution, the name of the official Cuban government newspaper is Grandma, the same name as the yacht. This photo illustrates the magnitude of the mutual aid societies. This is the theater of El Centro Asturiano de Tampa, the Asturian center of Tampa. As mentioned earlier, Asturias is a province in northern Spain from which a large number of immigrants came to Tampa. These were built and maintained through membership dues, not through any public funds. The club featured the third largest theater in Tampa, 
but it was the largest when it was built in 1912. The theater still exists today. The image also reflects the intense labor solidarity of the people of Ybor. This meeting was held to recognize the sixth month of a cigar maker strike, the largest at its time. This newspaper was written three days after Castro's takeover, which occurred on January 1st, 1959. The paper showcases how important Cuban current events and politics were for the people of Ybor City. Cuban events were deeply tied into the culture and people of Ybor City. Tamba had high support for Castro, helping him out and rooting for him when, where they could. You can see that even their newspapers, those were the front page news for the time. This ledger features attendees to a pro-Cuban revolution meeting in Tampa held on November 27th, 1955. If you see, the first attendee was Fidel Castro. He wrote down a visit to a corner of Martyism in honor and recognition of Tampa's role in the 1890s of supporting Cuba's fight for freedom from Spain, led by Jose Marti. The fourth signature down features the verbiage, Year of the Dictatorship, as a postscript to 1955, using it like how AD and BC are used. This shows the intense hatred of Batista, then ruling Cuba, in both Cuba and Ybor City. Next, look down at line five from the bottom. It reads, returning to the Cuban circle of Tampa, the name of the Cuban club in Tampa, is a way of returning to the mother country. To many, Ybor City represented what Cuba was prior to Batista. Ybor City was like the golden age of Cuba. The newspaper was written roughly one year after Castro took over Cuba, even though by this time it was now known that he was a communist. But support for him in Tampa and Ybor City remained strong, as opposed to Miami, which became the destination for many disillusioned middle and upper class Cubans. This reflects Tampa's history as a blue collar pro-union city. Tampa was staunchly pro-Spanish Republic and anti-fascist, as well as anti-Franco. It raised more money per capita in support of the Spanish Republic than any other city. These pins were, amongst any many other items, given to those who donated and participated in the fundraising effort to support the Spanish Revolution and Spanish Civil War. The Spanish societies often held rallies and fundraisers in support of the Republic in Spain also known as the Loyalists, because they were loyal to the democratically elected democracy, which Francisco Franco overthrew. In the 1930s, Spanish politics, Republican, in 1930 Spanish politics, Republican meant left of center, liberal and progressive, opposite of the United States. Pro-Francos were referred to as nationalists or nationalist Spain. They were considered to be more right wing and fascist. This was the actual flag of the Spanish Republic, which flew over the Centro Asturiano de Tampa from 1934 to 1939. The Spanish Republic was elected in 1934. In 1936, Francisco Franco, a pro-fascist Spanish army general, launched a coup d'etat against it. What ensued was a, ci a civil war that lasted until 1939 with a fascist victory. The Centro Asturiano refused, and still refuses, to fly the current Spanish flag over the building because of these events and in support of the Spanish Republic. This is a collage of membership IDs and dues and due receipts from the Centro Asturiano. Each society was independent of the others and would have their own dues and their own membership IDs. Due collectors would have collection routes throughout Ybor City and West Ham on Saturdays. Dues were min minimal, and into the 1960s, a family of five might pay approximately $20 per month for full benefits, including health care. Speaking of health care, that was the most important aspect of the various ethnic mutual aid societies. It was offered to all of their members, and it really helped them out. Tampa's immigrants in the early 20th century established a system of nonprofit cooperative health care which was rarely seen in the United States. While several societies had small clinics, the two larger Spanish societies, the Centro Asturiano and the Centro Español, 
had large hospitals from 1903 until 1990. The image on the left depicts the operating room at the Centro Espanol Hospital. In recent years, Ybor City has once again become a thriving community. Activism is still an important part of the Ybor experience. Ybor has also been actively trying to research and highlight its colorful history made by the many immigrants that built this wonderful city. So thank you. I failed to mention earlier, which I would like to mention now, a special acknowledgement of Rachel. Um, Anthony, who was supposed to give the presentation, had to have um, surgery earlier this year and was not able to fly and make it to the meeting. Rachel stepped in three weeks ago and put this together along with Anthony so that she could be here. That being said, she wants you to know her depth on questions may not be as deep as our original speaker. <laughs> so are there any questions or comments? Do you have a sense of how many of the families that settled in the area from Sicily and Cuba and Germany and so forth are still in the area? Is that where some of this material is coming from? Is the museum still getting donations? I'm, I'm very sorry. Mm -hmm. I don't know the answer. No, that's fair enough. <laughs> yeah. I know that there's a very thriving Spanish um, community right now in Ybor City just from visiting there on my weekends. So that's definitely, I can tell you that, like very strong Cuban and Spanish community. Anything else? Mark. Uh, this may or may not be relevant, but um, our, the Eber City Museum Society is affiliated with the El Lopez House. Is that right? I think so, yes. Okay, so the, I know that um, the El Lopez House has been really active in trying to document this um, Cuban, Italian, uh, connection there through the lens of baseball um, and that the Tampa Smokers were this like really cool you know community team that came out of these cigar factories I was wondering if you found any um, ephemera related to you know Al Lopez and his role um, you know w with the Tampa Smokers or if anything like that came out I know that there actually is ephemera for it unfortunately though because of the time constraint I was not able to visit and I receive any but I know that there definitely is a lot there so I'll have to visit in person yes. <laughs> <laughs> thank you in the winter, in the winter. <laughs> and I know there is a big involvement with baseball mm -hmm. down there so many years ago we did eat at the Columbia restaurant uh, which is a very handsome structure and striking with the tiled outside. But I'll never forget a wonderful piece of ephemera that was framed in the restaurant. I don't know if it's still there. It was from Generalissimo Franco, proclaiming the restaurant to be the best uh, Spanish restaurant outside of Spain. <laughs> <laughs> That's actually pretty great. Any other comments? Okay, thank you, Rachel.